Hi, I'm Mark Hellier and in this first short video I want to explain the format of Everyday English and how it's intended to be used. Now before I go over the teaching material I have to talk a little about language learning in general and how the brain and memory work but I'll keep that as brief as possible because I'm well aware that you may not share my enthusiasm for the subject. I'll go into these topics in more depth in other videos. Okay, so Everyday English is designed for teenagers on a short course in the UK where the emphasis is on oral communication skills rather than passing a written exam. There are two books, one containing 12 topic-based units based on the syllabus of the Trinity College graded examinations in spoken English and a workbook which focuses on pronunciation and aspects of British history and culture. Everyday English is different from most published course books because it doesn't have the usual grammar framework at its core. Instead, each unit contains a number of activities and exercises designed to act as a springboard for discussion around the topic. The reason for this is simple. A grammar-based syllabus is convenient for creating language tests and course books, but it doesn't have much to do with oral communication skills or reflect the way we naturally learn languages. The English that students study at school and need for passing exams is all about grammatical accuracy. Language is either right or wrong. It's very black and white. Real communication, however, is much more of a grey area. It's about conveying or understanding a message, and what's important is having the right vocabulary and being able to pronounce it. In fact, one study showed that 70% of communication breakdown between learners was due to pronunciation problems. In spite of this, it's an area of the language that teachers tend to avoid, probably due to lack of confidence. Grammar, on the other hand, gets lots of class time devoted to it, even though a wrong pronoun, a wrong tense, or the wrong word order is unlikely to prevent understanding. Another important fact about grammar that is often overlooked is that most grammatical descriptions are based on the written language, and writing and speaking are not the same thing at all. Most spoken discourse is composed in real time. Speakers are working out what they want to say and producing language at the same time. Because this is no simple task, native speakers make grammatical errors all the time. As listeners, we tend to filter out these natural kinds of errors because all we're interested in is the message. So focusing on grammatical accuracy is pretty low on the priority list when it comes to improving speaking and listening skills. Now let's have a quick look at how we learn languages, because this should inform our teaching as well. We start with individual words, then progress to combining words in very simple, but usually grammatically inaccurate sentences. Summed up very simply, the language learning journey goes from fluency to grammatical accuracy, which is a late acquired skill in the learning process. So what's going on in the brain during this learning process? Well, there are two memory systems, the declarative and the procedural. We use declarative memory to learn and store facts and our mental lexicon, i.e. vocabulary. This is the system your brain uses to remember that the French word for apple is pom, or that a fear of beards is called pogonophobia. You'll have to use these words to make some kind of emotional connection with them in order not to forget them, but initially processing this kind of information is simple and quick. It's our other memory system, procedural memory, that we use for acquiring new skills, such as driving or juggling, and it's this system we use to master the rule-governed sequencing of language, which we call grammar. As you can imagine, this is a much lengthier process than just learning facts or vocabulary, and requires a great deal of exposure to the language, and it's why most British people don't speak a second language. We don't acquire grammar just by having it explained to us and saying some practice sentences. It's far more complex than that, which is another very good reason not to spend a great deal of precious classroom time on grammar. A course which follows a traditional grammar-based syllabus essentially says this is how we learn language. Learn this rule and practice it, then learn this rule and practice it, and so on. And from all these grammatically accurate pieces of language, eventually you will be able to speak fluently. As I've already shown, this is pretty much the exact opposite of how we naturally learn language. What we do is use our declarative memory to build a vocabulary of useful items as we're exposed to the language. While that's going on, below the surface and over a much longer period, our procedural memory starts to make sense of the grammar, so our language gradually becomes more accurate. 
OK, so we've established that focusing on specific grammar items in class isn't the way to go for a number of reasons. So what are we going to focus on in the lessons? Well, because just 2,000 of the most frequent words in English make up 90% of most written texts, it makes sense to feed our students declarative memory with the most common English vocabulary wherever possible. And in order to nourish their procedural memory, we need to give them plenty of exposure to the language language which they can understand. The linguistic jargon is comprehensible input. The next thing to consider is that we actually forget about 75% of what we learn after just 48 hours. So we need to think about how we can combat the brain's natural tendency to forget. Repeating things at spaced intervals will help the conscious learning process as will writing things down. But for things to go in at a deeper level, information has to be transferred from the short-term memory, where it will be forgotten, to the long-term memory, where it will be remembered. The way this happens is through organising information in neural networks known as schemas. And in this process, the meaningfulness or emotional content of an item is important. When there is no motivation to remember something new, it just disappears from our short-term memory and we forget it. And we also forget things that we think we've already learned when they don't have enough connections in our memory networks and when they're not used often enough. If you think about your own memories for a moment, the stuff that you remember from way back will be stuff that means something or stuff that taps into your emotions, both good and bad. To sum up so far then, we need to one, shift the focus away from grammar if better oral communication skills are the goal. Two, give lots of pronunciation practice, three, focus on common vocabulary, four, provide comprehensible input, and five, make whatever we do in class memorable. Okay, now let's look at that last point, making whatever we do in class memorable. As I've already said, we remember things when they are meaningful, when they spark emotions, or when we can link them to our existing information. So how does this translate to effective classroom practice? Well, students will remember more if they're engaged, so we should try and set tasks where they are involved. Thinking and doing rather than just being told something. Sometimes moving around the classroom and interacting with different students. We need to do activities which are fun and interesting, ideally things which engross the students to the point that they forget they're in a language class. A little competitiveness through the use of games and quizzes is always good for achieving this. Just look at how many different quiz formats are reproduced on television channels around the world. People love doing quizzes and playing games. We need to use material which our students can relate to and we need to personalise it for them. Get students to give their opinions and share their experiences. We need to interact with our students, be interested in them and share stories and experiences with them. Teacher talking time can be very positive if it's comprehensible input that interests students. Lastly, we need to get away from just turning the pages of a book. I've said that published course books are predominantly based on grammar and explained why this isn't a great approach for learning to communicate. Another common feature of course books is their all-encompassing nature. They're presented as complete courses which contain all the necessary ingredients for learning English. All the teacher has to do is follow the teacher's guide and work through the book page by page. Unfortunately, this does not take into consideration the way we learn things or the fact that students do not want to spend hours of class time working through exercises in a course book. Any course material has to be considered within the framework of a course. Most short courses will have a teaching period of three to three and a half hours per day and it would be totally unrealistic to spend that time working through the pages of any course book. The teaching block has to be broken down into shorter, more manageable chunks. This kind of planning makes life easier for the teacher, and a change of pace every 20 minutes or so aids retention for the students. So you can see three blocks of roughly an hour each here, and these have been subdivided into shorter periods. I suggest teaching a longer first session when students are most alert, then a break followed by a shorter session with a teacher swap. I've also included a reminder at the beginning of each session to take a register. If you're teaching juniors, your first concern is child safety, so you need to know you have the right students in your class 
and report any absences to a senior member of staff. Now let's move on to review and intro. Review refers to the previous day's lesson and is an opportunity to check how much the students have remembered by asking a few simple questions. For example, what topic did we talk about yesterday? Can you tell me some of the key vocabulary, etc. This should be done with books closed and without letting students refer to any notes they may have made. The aim of this kind of exercise is to focus on the importance of memory and demonstrate how quickly we forget what we thought we had learnt only yesterday. Intro, of course, stands for introduction of the topic. It's always better to try and introduce the topic through some kind of short oral interaction, such as a simple question and answer session, or brainstorming vocabulary connected with the topic, rather than just opening the book and diving in cold. Moving on to the lesson proper, you can see the first chunk of class time is the topic-based discussion. As I've already said, the topics come from the Trinity College Spoken English Exam syllabus, and they're the same as those found in any published course book. The units are short, just two pages, because the course is short. Students won't want to spend hours and hours discussing a topic in great detail. They need more variety. The exercises and activities are intended to help you develop a conversation around the topic and fill between an hour and two hours of class time. There are no very prescriptive teacher's notes because every class is different and every teacher is different. Instead, there are suggestions of other activities or conversation topics that you might include, but that's a decision for you, the teacher, to make. Timing is very important. You need to use activities that are in the book and supplement them or skip things as you think best for your students and your situation. As you can see, after this first part of the lesson, the teaching session is made up of a number of shorter chunks covering a number of other topics. These are suggestions based on what has worked for me and are not fixed in any particular order. However, once you've decided on a plan that works for you, you should stick to it. Structure and routine will definitely make your life easier. As I've already mentioned, English pronunciation is a problem area for many learners and one which is often avoided by teachers. However, helping students understand the basic elements of English pronunciation should not be beyond even the most inexperienced native speaker teacher. The approach to pronunciation in everyday English is very simple. Start with the symbols for sounds that are obvious to anyone who is familiar with the Latin alphabet because they look just like letters, and then introduce the rest a few at a time. In the pronunciation lessons in the workbook, the phonemes are highlighted at the top of the section where they're introduced. The new phonemes in each lesson appear on a black background, while the phonemes yet to be introduced are in grey, like these examples from lesson two. After lesson one, the phonemes are never introduced more than three at a time. The first exercise in each pronunciation lesson is deciphering phonetic spellings. The words in these exercises only contain the phonemes introduced in the lesson, plus any of those previously introduced. So the one for the first lesson looks like this. Once the students know what to expect from the pronunciation lessons, they will become much easier to teach, and as the phonemic symbols are gradually introduced, they will provide more scope for teaching. At the beginning of each lesson, go over the symbols which were introduced in the previous lesson by pointing at them and getting students to produce the sounds. Use the wall chart if you have one, if not, use the back of the pronunciation workbook. Repetition is essential. Even if you spend 20 minutes drilling something on Monday, students can quite easily forget everything by Tuesday. Because the phonemes are introduced gradually, you can learn them at the same time as the students. You just need to make sure you're one step ahead. With a little effort and perseverance, you will soon develop a really useful classroom skill, and your students will quickly see the benefits of what you're doing. See Chapter 3 in 10 TEFL Shortcuts to Better Teaching for lots more guidance with pronunciation. The next slot on the timetable is marked Presentation Preparation. I've included this because discussing a topic prepared by the candidate is part of the Trinity College exam at most grades. Even if your students are not going to take the Trinity exam, this is still a worthwhile exercise to get the students to do. Students pick a topic which interests them and prepare a five minute talk on that subject. 
After three or four sessions preparing and practicing, students deliver the presentation to the rest of the class. If you have the facilities, you could record the presentations and play them back so students can comment on their performance, spot errors and suggest improvements. Teenage students may not seem particularly interested in aspects of British culture, but they will almost certainly have a programme of excursions running alongside their lessons, so it's important that you exploit this in class. There are 12 short texts in the Pronunciation and Culture Workbook, and these can be used as reading or listening exercises. Find out which places your students will be visiting during their time in Britain, and select which text you think will be most relevant. Use the last five minutes of the lesson to do a brief roundup of what you've covered. Make sure you have a list of the vocabulary and other language items in front of you, which students can't see, and try and elicit these language items from them. The beginning and end of your lesson are very significant because these are the parts students are most likely to remember. So this kind of roundup is a good way to make sure students leave the class with a clear idea of what you've been doing with them. That brings us to vocabulary. At the end of most units in everyday English, there's a crossword which recycles some of the vocabulary in the unit, so this is a good way to do some repetition of that. It's always a good idea to get students to work in pairs on this kind of activity so that students don't feel isolated. The crosswords will easily take 20 minutes or more, but if you, if you have access to a set of quiz word questions, it's good to get into the habit of integrating that into your teaching as well. Quizword is a vocabulary-based resource which can be used with elementary students and above. It contains only words from the most common 2,500 words, so you know that all of the content is useful for students, and it can be used in many different game formats, so it offers students a welcome break from book-based study. It's also all about speaking and listening, which, as we know, is what students need to practice. The next slot on the timetable is journal writing. The idea behind writing a short daily journal is that it personalises the student's experience and aids memory. The spaces for writing the journal are in the culture section of the workbook. Students will generally be resistant to journal writing because producing any kind of written work in class is seen as the most onerous of tasks. However, they should be encouraged to do it. Journal writing provides a real reason for students to write and will help them expand their vocabulary and practice spelling so it will help to build their confidence at writing in English. If it's done conscientiously, the book will also serve as a personal souvenir of the student's trip. Before starting the first journal writing session, you should point out some of the do's and don'ts to the students. You want to avoid repetition, that is, students writing the same thing or things every day. The diary can be as detailed or as brief as the student wishes, and the students can write about anything they've done, places they've visited and their reactions to them, the weather, friends they've made, the strange customs of the locals, etc. By the end of your introductory sessions, students should be clear that they have many possible topics to write about, and that they can ask you for help regarding vocabulary and grammar. To save yourself time, put phrases that you think will be useful on the board. At this stage, it's very important that you help supply the words and phrases they need and suggest better ways of phrasing sentences while you're going around monitoring. The last slot on the timetable is grammar. You might think this is a bit strange after the case I made for avoiding grammar, but like the topics, it's connected to the Trinity College graded exam syllabus. Although the Trinity exams are mainly focused on oral skills, there's a list of grammar items for each grade which students are expected to be able to use appropriately, so that's what I've included here. As with all the material in Everyday English, it's up to the teacher to decide if this will benefit the students and either use it or replace it with something else. That's all for this first video. In the next one I'll give you lots of practical tips on how to deliver the various sections of the timetable.